Hello, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to <clears throat> welcome you again to a lecture in the Critics Lecture Series sponsored by the Department of Art Criticism and Writing, of which I am the chairperson, Thomas McEvely. Thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> At our um, in initial lecture last month, we were really fortunate to have Arthur Danto. Uh, I was quite uh, in profoundly interested in his reflections, for example, about how it might happen that Kant would still be useful uh, and other things. Uh, this month, again, I think we're very fortunate to have Mira Shore, who's been a friend of mine for many years, and I'm um, happy to say has, has joined our faculty here at, in the Department of Art Criticism and Writing. Uh, Mira majored in art history as an undergraduate at NYU, then became a part of the Women's Studies program at CalArts in Valencia, California, where she earned her MFA. And thereupon, she began to write criticism rather furiously. I don't mean that she was always angry, but, <clears throat> <coughs> but she did definitely uh, establish for herself a name as a uh, person who takes strong positions and argues them strongly. And uh, uh, in her, this uh, wonderful book, Wet, on painting, feminism, and art culture. In the introduction, she talks about this period of her life a little. And she says that the uh, art historical study at NYU and the uh, women's studies program at CalArts were uh, equally and very uh, influential on her. And she describes her writings of that period like this. She said, the recipe could read as follows. Mix Hasidic Eastern European ancestors, European artist parents, a French education, New York School of Painting family friends, add a splash of H.W. Jansen, stir in a shot of Judy Chicago and Miriam Shapiro, a cup of conceptual art, simmer, and before serving, pepper with critical theory. After a dozen years or so, uh, Mira Shore, in conjunction with Susan B., who also is on our faculty, uh, founded the journal Meaning, which became a, a very significant alternative journal for the times, uh, that is the late 80s and early 90s, uh, with the unusual premise that it was designed primarily to be a, a, a compendium of artists' writings, not necessarily of critics' writings about artists, though critics did sometimes write in it. It seems that its primary mission was to uh, encourage artists to write and give them a place <clears throat> for their writings to find an audience, a place which uh, as they said repeatedly, uh, was both uh, without propaganda and without commodification. Uh, <clears throat> in 1996, Mira Shore and Susan B. stopped the publication of Meaning after 10 years, 10 very distinguished years, uh, and subsequently they put together a tremendously impressive collection of writings from Meaning, which has been published by Duke University Press. Uh, Mira Shore teaches at Parsons School of Design, and uh, I'm glad to repeat, uh, she now teaches here also, Mira Shore. Thank you. Thank you so much for such a wonderful introduction, which makes it possible for me to cut various things out of my talk. So, <laughs> um, 
And I also want to thank, uh, I want, I'm delighted to be here, and I also want to thank everyone who is here, who I can't see because this light is so blinding, um, for coming on Valentine's Day, and especially my friend Maureen Connor, who brought us lovely chocolates. Um, SVA put up this wonderful poster for my talk, <laughs> and, um, and it was very funny to actually see it because Tom had asked me to provide a little a title and then a blurb that would go on the poster, and I wrote him an email about two months ago, and he ended up using it as the blurb. My talk will be about the opposite of the economy represented by the short blurb. It will be about how long it takes me to construct essays that follow paths of investigation suggested by an initiatory insight about art not directly related to market or media agendas or schedules. So once I saw this, which I just saw this week, I thought, well, now I hope I've lived up to what I said I was going to do um, two, two months ago. In the current issue of the Brooklyn Rail and Joan Waltemath just arrived with a whole pile of them. There's an article that I wrote this fall entitled Work and Play about political cartoon animations and political humor that come to me in emails and web links to sites like too stupid to be president.com and various other ones. I hope you'll check it out to see. They're all hysterical and hopefully there'll be more this week. There already are actually. Um, I'll read the first couple of paragraphs of work and play. It begins with a quote from a New York Times call-out review. For the inaugural exhibition of its satellite location in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, the artist Emily Kotrenik is eating the wall that separates the gallery's exhibition space from the bedroom of its director. Video of her ingestion is included in the exhibition. She also removes some of the plaster and bakes it into loaves of bread, which are available for gallery visit visitors to sample. That's the end of the quote. What really matters, I mean really, beyond the rhetoric of it mattering, is having something to say that can truly reinvest familiar materials and forms with cultural energy. What makes something at least temporarily uncategorizable in relation to history and to ambient cultural language may require a self and other criticality that in some artists takes decades, not months, to develop. Yet now there is no time for the slow aesthetic growth that used to be one of the standard myths of origin of the artist. Meanwhile, every stroke, blob, or pixel has been analyzed, recycled, branded, as every trope has been trumped. The question is where to look for the work that really alters your world, not just the work that tells you why this world is so mutantly oriented to the commodification of tropes. Or, having had my methamphetamine, my hit of the latest rearticulation of the near past and the next modern, I need something I would describe as real food. I walk into a museum and have an intimate relationship with a random artwork from the past that suddenly speaks to me, if I'm in a museum that still allows for private experience. Or I take advantage of the exit conveniently gnawed open by the artist ingesting or regurgitating the possible toxic confines of the spaces of art, step outside, and turn to other modes of expression and cultural action than high art. This essay, Work and Play, is actually the expansion of the very last paragraph of a much longer essay that I was working on for the past couple of years, especially last summer, entitled Trite Tropes, Clichés, or the Persistence of Styles, with a last section subtitled Recipe Art. So it's sort of funny that there was a little recipe of who I am in wet. Um, which I had proposed to the Brooklyn Rail because I feel a great sense of commonality of purpose with the rail and I really enjoy reading it a lot. The editor with whom I worked at the rail, Joan Waltemath, very sweetly praised that original essay, and then she gradually urged me to focus only on the last paragraph, which was the positive section, and I was very happy to do so. However, the temporality of writing journalistically about the new means that one's own views can change more quickly than publishing schedules. 
When I wrote Work and Play in November, I felt hopeful that these cartoons were beginning to participate effectively in a great pushing back against the acts of evil that is our government. But by now, three months after I finished it, I feel more pessimistic. Anytime an essay is, pub is published, its thoughts are frozen in time. Whatever is bonded to the now quickly is superseded by the new now, so it is at best an artifact or a document. And then, of course, it changes so fast that since the day that I wrote that, about two days ago, something has happened that has re-enlivened uh, the humor. Um, and so now I'm feeling a teeny bit more, you know, a bit less pessimistic. All the more reason for me to regret the material that was not published. Only the one quote and three paragraphs remain of the longer essay in which I track three zones of conformity in art practice. It is what was not published, what does not get published, and why that I want to address tonight. I started work on tonight's lecture with a few words scribbled on a page. Criticality, time, time versus schedule, speculativity. I'm actually not sure that is a word, but I was thinking about the process of speculative thought as opposed to commodificative text. I'm working on a book in which nonconformism is a central theme, with a particular emphasis on how aesthetic, cultural, and political values one has been imbued with during one's life structure one in such a way that in relation to present values, one becomes nonconforming. I also sketch two circles representing the two main forces between which I feel I must navigate when I write. I name these forces for the fabled nautical perils of Greek mythology, Scylla and Charybdis, where the Ionian and the Mediterranean seas between Sicily and the Italian mainland meet. Both were once beautiful nymphs transformed by a god or goddess. Charybdis had stolen the oxen of Hercules and was turned by Zeus into a whirlpool whose vortex three times a day swallows the waves of the sea and anything upon them. Scylla was a nymph turned into a monster because of the jealousy of the gods. Either Poseidon's wife, or in other versions of the tale, Circe, was jealous of her. And she was turned into a monster with six vicious dog heads springing from her neck. She lurks in a cave at the top of a rock-faced cliff. At first, she was horrified by her transformation. But then she began to enjoy her anger and relish devouring passing sailors. Putting aside for, let's, let's identify with Scylla. Anyway, putting aside for a minute the consideration that like most Greco-Roman mythological monsters, both are female, two themes emerge from these stories. First, the theme of jealousy. And we can trace onto this theme the zero-sum game of power and exclusion of the art industry's obsession with celebrity and art history's work of canon formation. Secondly, they represent the theme of cooperation between forces that appear to oppose each other. Only together do they threaten the passage of sailors through the sea between them, because as you move to avoid the one, you risk getting too close to the other. On my diagram of the field upon which I write about art, I placed October to the left. They'll be happy to hear that and what I call art market media to the right. And here I place the various official news and ideas organs of the international art market, Art Forum, Art in America, Freeze, et cetera, as well as local popular journalistic press that's aimed at a general audience, the New York Times, the Village Voice, the New Yorker, New York Magazine, Time Out, et cetera. So the question is, which one is which monster? My interpretation here is that October is Scylla, an impressive ideological structure, impermeable to influence, interested in absolute aesthetic power in the real world of art institutions. In my quick diagram, I wrote under October Scylla, kind of like a little report card, excellent scholarship, high standards but narrow focus, exclusionary and involved with ownership of careers and art history, vindictive. Charybdis, the whirlpool sucking into the deep all who pass, is the mainstream art press whose requirements for content is never satisfied and whose obsession with discovering and marking celebrity for the market entails the disappearance of the recently new in a constant swirl 
which eventually tosses up its wrecked victims to float off into the vast ocean replaced by the newer new. If in mythology Scylla and Charybdis's original narratives are unrelated to each other, in the economy I've just suggested, they're curiously interdependent. October owes its birth to a succession of art forum editors and writers in the mid-70s. To themselves, they stand for the true history of modernism and postmodernism against Philistines and heathens. Art Forum eventually moved towards a more market orientation, signaled by its increasingly spectacular appearance and contents. But while October retains its standards of scholarship and its significantly elegant and uncluttered modernist appearance, it too is engaged in star making through stalwart support of chosen artists, despite its protestations of institutional critique and purely intellectual or critical motivations. Further, the editors of October are brought in as the ultimate imprimatur of art historical and critical importance when Art Forum needs to be assured of that authority. You can just look at this month's um, issue for examples. Now these were more or less the geographical conditions of art criticism at the point at which I began to write about art, or in keeping with my initial nautical metaphor, set sail in my little boat on the sea of art writing. I started writing in the early 80s when I observed major changes in art and art theory, an absolute reversal of attitudes about studio process, and a reversal of values about feminism, which had just barely had a decade to develop into art. These changes were epitomized for me in the work of someone I'd gone to art school with and who was suddenly extremely successful financially and critically, that is, David Sally. No one was writing what I thought, although they might have been saying it in private. So I started to work on an essay eventually entitled Appropriated Sexuality, which is the first essay in WET, about the misogyny of the depiction of women in Sally's work and the complicity of the critical apparatus that supported him. I began with no ideas about publication. I just wrote and researched. But as it came into its final form, I began to send it around to other artists and to various magazines. It was the subject of many letters of rejection from both mainstream and high academic journals that were quite informative about the parameters of art writing. At one point, it was actually accepted for publication by a middle stream regional art magazine and then dropped at the very last minute. Meanwhile, my manuscript had been shown to another writer who then published in the same journal a more wishy-washy text in which my ideas were vaguely alluded to as some feminists say. A typical example of the kind of balanced writing that is very common in much mainstream media and whose true agenda is the devaluation of opposing views. So that was Charybdis. A thoughtful rejection from October taught me one of the principal methods society deploys to deal with resistance. They tell you you're doing something wrong, even if you're right, even if they think you're right. They didn't like Sally any more than I did, but the enterprise of critiquing him must be approached with, quote, great caution. My error was in focusing on his representations of women because that was based on an erroneous, an erroneous essential, <laughs> um, on an erroneous represent, on um, an erroneous essentialist premise that such a thing as women could still be considered a viable category, as opposed to the theoretical point of view that women was a social construct, whereas from their point of view the real problem was not what he was painting but that he was painting. <laughs> I tell this quite old story because this initial experience with, what I, with how what I thought turned into something considered nonconformist and thus unpublishable in its true form led me and Susan B. to decide to publish our own journal, Meaning. We didn't publish any ads. There were no reproductions, so the text had to be read, and so that authors would have to actually engage with visual artworks in their language, thereby foreclosing the most common relation to art magazines, which is just to check the ads and look at the pictures. 
We offered a space for artists' voices within the discourse and welcomed nonconformist views and styles of writing. We didn't seek to stake a power position in the art world, but rather to suggest the existence of a lively and diverse world of creativity and opinion that power ignored. Meaning offered me the freedom to write at the tempo and the word count I needed and to write about what I was thinking. Because Charybdis Art Forum's supportive and dependent relation to the market is enacted in work rules and schedules that enforce conformism. Let's take the question of time. If you examine Art Forum, the actual magazine, not the trope, you see that it's as predictably scheduled as a minuet. If it's September, it must be season preview. If it's December, it must be best of. If it's January, it must be first takes and winter preview. Then there's the Venice Biennale and the Whitney Biennial. Major retrospectives are planned years in advance, as are the articles to be published just before the show. Anything that is not specifically about something that is occurring in the market in that bracketed present tense of first takes and best of, but may nevertheless have import for art practice, cannot appear. Speculative and associative thinking that isn't market-oriented is not going to have much play. There's no time for second thoughts, afterthoughts, thought. Time is also repressed at the level of space. Time is money, money is time and space. You can't run long, you're given word counts. For work and play, the rail gave me 2,000, and I ran long at 2,136. Now, word counts can be very good for writers. There's an important formal challenge in having to zero in on what you really must say. However, there's a limit to the effectiveness of that logic. Some things must take the time they must take in order for the full complexity of a point of view to be articulated. In meaning, we had no word counts. An essay was as long as it needed to be, not as long as we needed it to be in order to accommodate a commercial agenda. Charybdis also is unlikely to publish much in the way of negative criticism, especially since the editorial space is essentially bought back from the advertising space. And the advertisers, including most of the art world, obviously don't want truly negative criticism of their product. The question of negative criticism comes up a lot when art criticism is discussed. At a panel on art criticism at SBA in this room in March 2004, entitled The Crisis in Art Criticism with Saul Ostro, Nancy Prinzenthal, Rachel Rubenstein, Jerry Saltz, and Katie Siegel, there was a general consensus that overall they favored writing positive criticism, citing as their reasons the importance of supporting work that they liked, especially given that their opportunities to publish and space for their writing was limited, so why waste it on negativity? But a distinction was not made between negativity and criticality. There may be aspects of contemporary artworks and discursive market patterns that must be discussed and analyzed, even if that analysis may be negative from the point of view of the market. I want to encourage curiosity and skepticism, not cynicism, which would mean just staying at the level of that sucks or it's all bullshit. This is just a micro version of the condition of political discourse in America today, where the dominant media format is sucks bullshit, and you don't hear longer format thoughtful criticism of the regime from the mainstream, while the rhetoric of the regime is that criticism equals treason. Productive criticality may call for hybridity of interests and references, and here some increasingly personal comments are in order. At the moment, it's particularly fashionable to bash October over the content and tone of art since 1900, modernism, anti-modernism, postmodernism, which was recently published by four October editors, Benjamin Buchler, Roz Krauss, Eva Lambois, and Hal Foster. Now, I have to confess to you that at $85 and about 10 pounds, I haven't bought it yet. But I have looked at it, and when I opened it up, having heard about all the negative criticism, I, saw, I looked at one page and thought, oh right, this is totally brilliant and I would be happy if my students knew some of what's in this book. And yet, I'm sure that the critical views that I've read hold a lot of truth, which is they touch on familiar themes, excellent scholarship, yet obscurantist language, 
exclusion of popular culture, repudiation of visual pleasure in contemporary art, and a nepotistic circle of references. I was particularly amused by the similarity of title between Rob Storr's commentary in the November-December 2005 freeze entitled, All in the Family is the New Art History a One-Party State, and Jonathan Schell's December 12, 2005 letter from Ground Zero in The Nation entitled, The Fall of the One-Party Empire. Both speak of empire, and if anything, Shell sees the current Republican Party American empire as more unstable than Storr sees the October empire. This is not news to me. In my essay from the late 80s, Figure Ground, I referred to the October crowd as aesthetic terrorists and analyzed Buclo's critique of painting through the intersection of two texts about fluidity. French feminist psychoanalytic theorist Luce Irigaray's study of femininity and fluidity in Speculum of the Other Woman, with German historian Klaus Thewelite's description in his book Male Fantasies of the violence-inducing fear of flow embodied in women by the soldier male of the post-World War I Freikorps, thereby implying that there was a suppressed pathological aspect to Buclo's fear of paintings flow and goo that linked him to the underlying psychology of fascism. <laughs> I always say, and I wonder that he doesn't really refer reference my writing. Um, this interjection of these texts onto a critique that would never acknowledge them embodies one aspect of hybridity in action. So perhaps it will surprise you when I say a few words in acknowledgement of October's importance to me like Odysseus, who was able to avoid Charybdis's whirlpool because he could hear its roaring waters, but thus veer too close to Scylla, who reached down from her cave and ate six of his sailors, I pay very little mind to Charybdis' art form, but I am often enough really interested by things I read in October. In particular, many of the subjects Buclo returned to again and again are the nexus of material of the greatest significance and extraordinarily useful to me. Painting and the impact of National Socialism and the Holocaust on post-war art, among other subjects. My interest may seem paradoxical because Buclo directs close attention to painting via his conviction in and desire for its end but in some weird way, he cares deeply about it. The critique of painting fascinates me as a painter as well as as a writer. I tend to place myself in direct proximity to art and ideas that are the most opposite and opposed to mine. These provide a challenge to my assumptions, a balance on sentimentality, and the possibility of change through exposure to an other. And my only wish would be that October would extend the same kind of interest in its other. The past couple of years, I've been editing the wonderful writings of the painter Jack Torkov. And I took the title that I chose for the collection, The Extreme of the Middle, from a statement of Torkov's that I find very compatible with my own. In a journal entry from 1959, he wrote, in art, then, I am against the extremes, those that appeal to elite attitudes, and I'm for the extreme of the middle, the creative middle. He also wrote, all programs represent future sorrows. And, final, and finally, I am against any ideology which takes any significant part of humanity as its enemy, whose extermination it seeks in order to ensure its own survival. My indication of Tworkov creates the moment to interject some personal background that might explain how I've come to write what I write. And I had, a, in writing this talk, I battled with myself about including any of this. Actually, some of it is in that little segment that Tom picked out of WET. Um, and yet, it, because I felt that what was specific to me would not be of general, general applicability to others, and yet it at least gives an example of how sources for hybridity can exist. So the first thing is that I'm a painter. A lot of people who are my friends who knew I was giving this talk said, well, you must explain that, of course, you're a painter. Um, and it's true that I painted for about 15 years of my professional life, 
before I started to write, so it's my primary identification and perhaps my primary practice, although at this point I feel they're equal. Therefore, I could say that I approach the art object and art writing from the point of view of my engagement with art making. But just being a painter doesn't ensure a non-conformist point of view. There are plenty of artist writers deeply enmeshed in a conformist critical practice, including, for example, a number of male artists who paint grids and write about other male painters who paint grids. The way in which a, being a painter influences my writing is probably more important at the level of craft in how I write. My process of constructing an essay is part of what ends up making it a text that others might find nonconformist. I don't set out to write something nonconformist. I just set out to write, and what I write gets constructed by others as nonconformist or challenging or maverick in relation to their agendas and ideologies. My writing begins with a supposition, an intuition, the crystallization of something emerging from what I've seen or read. Having crystallized the conclusion that something exists, I set out to prove it retroactively. I try to develop the idea as completely as possible and with as many counter arguments as I can anticipate, like building a legal brief. I read for my writing. My research is instrumental, but contingent. Sometimes the readings hijack me for months. To write about Richter, I, spent, I ended up spending a winter reading Primo Levi's Survival at Auschwitz, The Drowned and the Saved, and The Reawakening. The latter was so magical that I deferred finishing the book for a couple of weeks, stopping at the penultimate page and going backwards, which actually is partly the theme of the book, which is the necessary and almost mythological and mythologically oriented time that it took for Levy to get from Auschwitz back home to Turin. Not Torino. Um, what, but all of this may show up in the text as a short quote or just a reference, even though it took perhaps several months or a year of deep intimacy with an artist's or author's mind. And my writing is an excuse and a vehicle for my own education. An essay also provides the final magnet for stray flickers of matter, a memory, an image, a word held in my mind for years finally finds a place for me to expel it from my mind into a context in which it can at last contribute. My writing is fundamentally political, but I hope that I defy the stereotypes that adhere to that definition. Feminist polemics may not seem congruent to reflections on the death of painting and the history of the Holocaust. It may also mean that an essay may take strange turns, like this talk. And that may be particularly challenging now when there's a desire for text to just tell you what to do and what to think, rather than accept that it may just have made you think, or even just made you aware that there is such a thing as a realm of ideas, which is what I would like to accomplish. There's some other personal instances of hybridity that help create my oblique point of view and methods. My European refugee parents, their histories of oppression and, an and annihilation induced in me a permanent sense of the utter realism inherent to paranoia. Also, they were artists, and between the two of them, their art carried unusual DNA from the point of view of a standard American take on post-war art. This is the part that is particular to me, so I don't know how useful it is, and yet I felt I had to say it. With roots in Hasidic tradition of devotion to studying text, hopelessly related to unrelated to commercialism, and um, both of them were immersed in the painting of the School of Paris, which was held in some suspicion by the New York School abstractionist, some of whom were my parents' dearest friends, including Jack Torkov. So from earliest childhood, I was at the same time imbued by what I later learned was an aesthetic system called Greenbergian formalism, and by an aesthetic that was completely foreign to it. These early experiences formed what has continued to be a complex relationship to modernism and postmodernism, especially because the first chapter of my own life as an artist 
was determined by my exclusion from that modernist school because of what I was interested in making art about when I was a young woman. That is my experience of living inside a female body with a mind. And the aesthetic means by which I first chose to express this experience through autobiographical narrative, representation, and in small scale based on non-modernist art from the past or from other cultures, all of which were still forbidden at that moment. Barnett Newman long ago wrote the definitive reason why a visual artist would write. In his useful aphorism, an artist paints so that he will have something to look at, at times, he must write so that he will also have something to read. If I repeat that wonderful aphorism, it is with a twist suggested by the gender of the pronouns naturalized in, New in Newman's usage. The abstract expressionists understood only they could set the aesthetic and critical terms for their work. I was a student in the feminist art program at CalArts in the early 70s at the beginning of the feminist art movement at a moment when it was thrillingly clear that if you wanted your own history researched, the canon of art history opened, your work shown and discussed according to its own premises, you were going to have to do it yourself. If I write politically, I don't write strategically. If I were trying to get in with power, it would be, do much better to conform, to drink the Kool-Aid, as I suggested in joking subtitle for the talk. Think that everything that appears in the market is just great. Write positively about famous male artists or stay safely in one or the other established feminist preserve. Instead, my writing and my painting are initiated by the clash of deeply held aesthetic, religious, and political values with art and ideas that I at least at first and sometimes finally at last find hostile or irreconcilable to my own. Or, as Adorno wrote, the splinter in your eye is the best magnifying glass. I'd like to focus in the final part of this lecture on what didn't get published in the Brooklyn Rail from trite tropes, cliches, or the persistence of styles and recipe art. Because the essay is long, I'll just pick out a few paragraphs and sketch in the rest. Um, at the 2004 SVA panel on criticism, there was a barely expressed subtext that the crisis was a crisis of art, not art criticism. The most likely action on the part of mainstream media, whether Scylla or Charybdis, would be to look for the next star, the artist or art movement that would make everything better. In Trite Tropes, I've taken another direction, which is to look at the persistence and proliferation of cliches and tropes most pernicious at the initiatory moment of art school. To look for an art of nonconformist criticality in art, which would be more important than looking for it in art criticism, I look to the production of conformism in art education and other institutions. In the case of this essay, that first moment, that first fleeting awareness that something exists and now I must find it, came during my service on a slide jury for an art residency program. And this is the first quote from Trite Tropes. Typically, during the preliminary round of a slide jury, jurors must look at anywhere from four to 8,000 slides in one day, in groups of four or five images per 15 to 30 seconds. Slide, 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 slide. Or in some cases, five slides, five slides. After the first few hours, things may get a little silly. Jurors can't help but notice patterns, some of them inane. One year, there may be an inordinate amount of paintings of pears. The next year, of sheep. When the tenth sheep appears, helpless hilarity may ensue. However, a fly on the wall glimpse into and a deconstructive exegesis of such sessions would certainly be worth a year of graduate school. First, it would reveal the existence of an established knowledge base of art codes widely shared by jurors who are usually selected to represent disparate aesthetic and social views. Jurors hope for an individual voice to emerge from the artist's conversation with art history and contemporary art, but this is the rarest thing. So they look for familiarity and competence in the chosen style. 
Jurors know the basic vocabulary and cliches of each genre. I've been, I'm taping the dog show, so it's the same idea. You know, they know what each little doggy has to, has to have, you know, whether it's uh, a pincher or a mini pin. The criterion is how well the familiar is deployed and articulated. They feel duty bound to choose the best of styles they don't personally work in. Democracy does reign. At the same time, the process would uncover the existence of a predictable range of known styles from the past hundred years so that they can be summarized instantly in shorthand descriptions. And these are quotes from that session. Tripe and trippy. That's David Humphrey was, who was here. Then I, I took it down. Pearlstein on acid, slack or gustin. We all nod in agreement. We groan when the artist evidently couldn't decide which trope they wanted to address and threw too many style references into the pot. What were they thinking? This range of cliches is not a new phenomenon. One of my most treasured memories from a slide jury is of the moment when, during a graduate admissions committee meeting at the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design in the mid-70s, after about the 20th submission of work incorporating branches, twigs, hay, and stones, one of my colleagues turned to me and said in a snarly whisper, what's that, some kind of paleolithic sandwich? <laughs> now it's indicative of the persistence of styles and cliches that although this pithy comment was made at a time when such work was rife, but at least associated to a societal interest in the environment and a reaction formation to factory produced minimalism. Today, twigs and branches still make regular appearances whenever artists want to reference nature. Jurors may find themselves judging work not only by um, the artist's skill in his or her chosen style, but also by how relatively recent their chosen style is. Has the artist picked up the most recent message from Earth or the one sent out into the ether 50 years ago? One of the first paragraphs of the essay reads as follows. Old styles never die. They just continue to permeate the substrata of American art, lurking under the radar of the mainstream art world. Mutating and merging, they form new subspecies of styles with recognizable characteristics and a persistent life of their own. Yet made up of cliches from styles whose original radicality, purpose, and lineage are lost, they are unconscious of their own existence as specific and historically based style types. Like nuclear waste, old styles leach out from under the lead and concrete bunkers that avant-garde criticism has built to protect the new from their pollution and to deny their continued existence. The range of style types is insulated from or changes at a slower pace than the rest of the art world. While the centers of the international art world cling to the belief in constant newness, which despite the recent rhetoric of the post-historical still pertains. The hundredth issue of October magazine was devoted to the concept of obsolescence as a potential site for resistance. But I'm interested in something else. Not the artistic style that's instrumentally recycled at the right moment to speak to present concerns while burnishing the patrilineal credentials of the new generation, but the phenomenon of many artistic styles continuously living a half-life in a space just adjoining the art world that October Art Forum and other major art publications recognize and vision or champion. Just as the near past may be obsolete, the near art world is obscured. But if it is just the dust that follows a comet's ball of ice, the tail of the art comet is much larger than its head, and there may be some value in studying it. My first order of business was actually to find some of this imagery because, you know, you when you're in one of the slide juries, you can't, take the, you can't take pictures of what you're looking at, and you can't take the slides home with you. One of the places I looked was the artist space file, the online registry, which offers a pull-down menu of 60 categories of styles by which the artist can self-identify his or her work. And I'll just read some of them to you. 
autobiographical, abstract, allegorical, architecture, assemblage, biomorphic, cartoonesque, color field, conceptual, constructed, decorative, documentary, environmental, erotic, expressionistic, fantasy, feminist, figurative, functional, geometric, hard edge, humorous, illusionistic, ironic, kinetic, kitsch, linear, literary, lyrical, minimal, narrative, nudes, optical, popular imagery, portraits, primitivistic, psychological, religious, romantic, serial, sociological, spiritual, surreal, symbolic, technological, temple l'oeil, urban. <laughs> Artists are encouraged to cross-reference themselves when they enroll their work on the online file so as to achieve the widest possible coverage in relation to the curators who may be searching through the file. Curators, curators can find the work they're looking for through these pathways of labeling, but the system is also a recognition of the arguably rather depressing fact that artists can be and in fact must be pigeonholable in such a manner. The variety of choices masks an incredible process of homogenization. This works in tandem. Artists choose from the menu the cliched style most appropriate to their expressive needs and the few key words that will define them. And curators go shopping for hard edge or didactic. They are shopping for artworks they have already imaged in their head. And they will find them since everyone participates in the code. Now, I have to confess, I collect tropes, stylistic tropes. Um, it's what makes it bearable for me to go to the Armory or the Whitney. I'm trawling for tropes, looking for blurs or whatever I happen to be interested in. On the jury in question, we decided that a moratorium should be declared on family photos, cartoons, waifs, underwear, childhood dresses, blobs, and hair. But actually, all of these are recent and current tropes and our moratorium pertained to the work that we did accept. But what I'm interested in is what we rejected, ahistorical, degraded, unconscious, and unnamed stylistic hybrids, many of which we see in other parts of our professional practice. Are there underlying meta-categories for these st persistent styles? Now, in my, I basically narrowed it down to two persistent style families, the popularity of surrealism and the continued struggle to adapt a desire for representation, particularly figuration, with the spatial flatness developed through the history of 20th century abstraction. I'll read a little from the section on surrealism. Surrealism's influence is paramount. It privileges an irrational, violence-based, uh, violence-oriented unconscious. It allows for figuration, narrative, for symbolism and theatricality. It fosters creepiness and horror. It appeals to and allows for the visualization of basic tropes of embodiment, fear of contingency, the body, death, sexuality, blood. It accommodates the desire many artists have to speak individual stories and the desire to speech, to, sorry, the desire to speak strange and scary things, to be weird that is particularly resonant to so much popular culture, much of, which, much of which is itself an emanation of surrealism, horror movies, animation, et cetera. The narratives and images in our dreams have been fed into and back out of surrealism to such an extent that we experience our dreams as surrealistic art events. Again, what is so notable in the persistence of styles is the genericity of such tropes the homogenization of quirkiness, so that the common phenomenon of throwing in extra sim symbolism in order to be creepier and more expressive than the next guy seems like an anxiety that also reads as false speech, a sense of the unimaginative hidden behind the excessively imaginative. The part about um, the desire to integrate imagery within abstraction um, led me to looking, for example, at a show in 1978, the New Image Painting, and, um, and also to look at images of what I call pictographic painting, which you see a lot of, which are generally like a sort of a flat background, maybe a grid, and then scratched in little pictographic pictures that have some recognizability that owe a great debt to Paul Clay, for example. Um, predictability, historical iteration, 
and the lack of individual search are as, if not more prevalent and intractable in work that is considered successful in the contemporary art market. The part of the essay that appears in vestigial form at the beginning of Work and Play in the Rail is recipe art, which is about the most successful work in this paradigm and about the educational and art world systems that create and reward it. The essay is interspersed with quotes from art reviews in which I've emphasized the elements of recipe art that I've been noticing for a few years. So I'll read them and I'll sort of boldface the uh, recipe. Life-size Zamboni constructed out of rigid pale green insulation foam. Chandelier made of 14,000 tampons. Gravel out of Play-Doh, self-portrait carved on an aspirin. Color field fresco in aqua toothpaste. Life-size figure in sugar cubes. Recipe. Something from culture plus something from art history plus something appropriated plus something weird or expressive equals useful promotional soundbite. The work is selected for review because it can be written about efficiently. It is not necessary to see the piece. The Jewish Museum exhibition Mirroring Evil provided classic examples of the genre, including Lego concentration camp set and Prada death camp. Two paradigms in three words are relevant to the mechanism. Buchenwald plus Coke can were enough to make the work memorable, sight unseen. This is conceptual art adapted to the market age. In 1968, Lawrence Wiener wrote, one, the artist may construct the work. Two, the work may be fabricated. Three, the work need not be built. Each being equal and consistent with the intent of the artist, the decision is to condition rest with the receiver upon condition of receivership. All things being equal, when conceptual art was new or renew given the precessionary model of Duchamp, it was not necessary to physically realize the work. The idea was the work. Now, in recipe art, while the verbal describability of the work may matter more than its physical manifestations in terms of its circulation through the media into discourse, the current conditions of receiver receivership are such that it's apparently again necessary to make the work, contrary to the original radical implications of Wiener's formula because this conceptual work is being done with the market as a goal. The conceptual quotient operates primarily as a marketing device. A mass mocha ad in the New York Times this summer, watch as David Cole uses excavators to knit the world's largest American flag. The major lineages that dominate the substyles I described earlier pertain to the top of the food chain of, contem of contemporary art practice. Surrealism continues to be a major influence, evident in the extravagant imaginary creatures populating Matthew Barney's Cremaster series and the goth sensibility of many artists, the return of psychedelia, um, general fascination with a kind of Dungeons and Dragons teenage boy fantasy world in one variant or a pseudo-cosmological fanta fantasy world in another, fairy tales, narrative scenes from dark, lurid to cute, from Kiki Smith and Sue DeBeer to Amy Cutler. At the same time, the rules of modernism still apply. Good recipe art is formally flawless. All visual languages used are fully understood and cannily rearticulated. Their success depends on the canniness of the rearticulation, the knowing manner of juxtaposition. You always know what is being done to what is being quoted. In recipe art, there will be no errors of appropriation. Um, recipe art, oh, sorry, sorry. Part of the source for the proliferation of trite tropes, etc., lies paradoxically in inadequate or non-existent early art education and in poor art historical instruction. Um, and I'm just looking to see, I mean, how many artists go to the Met? How many people who are perpetuating surrealism have ever seen a Max Ernst or an early Dolly in person? And even if people focus only what is in Chelsea galleries now, they may 
not even know much about the near past, what was in those galleries five years ago might have better luck being known if it was actually prehistoric. Or artists may not know the deep past of art. Who has time anyway? Thus they mine a shallow load. This lack of historical knowledge makes people even more vulnerable to the lure of recipe art. It is so much quicker to learn and establish recipe than to understand the history of food. Recipe art emerges from the complicity of some fine arts departments and schools with the values of the art world and art market. In fact, such complicity is a, prere a prerequisite for success for the institution, whatever its actual impact on art. Last year, one of the institutions that I teach at sent out a card announcing a panel on self-promotion for artists and designers, the brand called you. Students frequently express tremendous anxiety at the idea that their work displays any influence. The work was made to be incorporated into the market and the discursive stream of the academy. That its originality is homogenized is part of its ethos. It may be chillingly, even heartlessly, proficient. But that proficiency is a good indicator that we find ourselves in the neo-new academy. Now, I see my, stu my students struggling to master these styles and tropes, leaving little time or will to question them. And those who master them easily have even less incentive to question what brings them some early success in what this year's Whitney Biennial co-curator Philippe Verne referred to on a recent panel as the art industry. He said, there used to be a community of artists, then there was an art world, now there's an industry. To join the industry, you have to accept its power structure, including most paradoxically its rhetoric of freedom, the illusory freedom to make any kind of art you want, although that often is just the freedom to rearticulate familiar tropes. And just at the moment where you seem to have freedom to do anything, but actually real freedom is being taken away. There's very little risk of rebellion when rebellion is itself purely spectacular within established models, always already co-opted, and of course even less risk for absolute conformity of mediocrity. Now, I find myself sounding as if I've turned against art, because to me it sounds like the sound of fiddling while Rome burns. But that's not a call for overtly political art, but for art made with something other than exclusive interest in the art market. For the future of art and culture, being trained to be swallowed up by Charybdis is a disaster. So what are my solutions, if any? Economic conditions make my solutions only dreams. If I could wave a magic wand or twinkle my nose, I would declare a moratorium not just on squiggles, images of childhood and hair, but on six years of art school and on, and on cradle robbing by dealers and collectors so as to give artists breathing space to grow up and test their desire to make art and figure out what they really want to make art about, not just to order from column A or column B of the menu of recipe art. I'd give the gift of time for wandering around the Met and MoMA until you could feel that you could make everything in there. Time to work or not work in your studio Time to just take a walk, not just because you're going somewhere, but to experience the city or land that you live in. I turned the lights off on the reality show, The Art World. Last year, one of my students actually went to a casting call for Art Star, the first ever unscripted television series set in the New York art world, and that was sponsored by Deitch Projects. At this point, looking deeply at a Fra Angelico may be the only thing between you and insanity. <laughs> the book I'm working on begins with the following anecdote. A few years ago, during a break from teaching, I was enjoying my favorite snack, a madeleine dipped in espresso. One of my students asked me what I was eating. A madeleine, I said. I explained that it was an important part of the history of literature, that in Marcel Proust's remembrance of things past, the act of dipping a madeleine into tilleul released the totality of the author's memories of his childhood and the meaning of the work he was undertaking. Oh, my student said as he walked away, I learned something new today. 
about Proust, I said, hopefully, ever the pedagogue. About a new cookie, he said. <laughs> My book is not about new cookies. The first several pages of Proust's Swan's Way are devoted to an extended detail to the point of being soporific description of the mechanics of falling asleep. I thought that year of reading it out loud to my class. It, it would have been a kind of performance piece, but the slow pace might have seemed like abuse to them. Yet we all need sleep. We yearn for deep and restful sleep. Desperate, we skip the stages of experiences described by Proust and just reach for the Ambien. I too drink espresso and I reach for the Ambien. But the sleep that I speak of is not the anesthesia and hypnosis of the alienated participant of the spectacle. It is the regenerative sleep of open search and fertile dreams that can lead to an art of nonconformist criticality. And I don't care whether that art takes place within fine art or elsewhere, because if it happens in one place, it will happen everywhere. There's a little time for questions and sound effects. I didn't see you at all while I was reading. It was quite weird, the light. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. I, th I think when I, I guess the way I'm using hybridity is the way I understand the word. I mean, to, to uh, a hybrid is a creature made from more than one living entity, basically, um, or uh, like, you know, wine or the, the vines are hybrids of different stock. So it enriches the DNA, um, and so that's that's really what I'm, the way I'm thinking of it is an enrichment of a complexity of sources. When you talk about appropriation and art being appropriated and sort of trying to make hybrids, how do you feel about uh, Winkelmann's idea that truly great art comes from appropriation and you can only make something truly great if you appropriate it and imitate something from the past and add a piece of your soul to it in order to make it something mm -hmm. bigger than itself. Well, then that's, an, that's interesting because <clears throat> actually, I, as an artist, I learned a great deal from the movement appropriation art and from the, some of the mechanisms that I learned from it. It, it. it liberated me from certain aspects of invention and it, it it provided a way of really being in touch with things that were happening in the world that I could use in my work. The kind of approach, what I'm, what I'm referring to in recipe art is a kind of endless loop of appropriation of trite tropes. So it's not, it's not, it's, it's absolutely the opposite in a way of creatively using appropriation to piggyback important ideas of your own in work. That's really what I, I hope that answers it. I don't know if it would answer Winkleman, but. Anna. Gotcha. Thanks. Uh, hello? I, I'll, yeah, I'll trouble, I'll do, I'll do the opposite, I'll trouble it, you know, like yeah.
<laughs> I, you know, it's funny because I, I, um, I always find the endings, since this, is, this talk is partly about the craft of crafting a talk um, or an essay, I always find endings sort of hard. You know, it's like you have to, it's, it's hard to get the, the car going, you know, and then it's really hard to bring it to a stop and you, you kind of feel like you have to say something at the end. So I've noted, I've noticed often that I come to these slightly hyperbolic endings and in this one I was sort of tempted to add and by the way this is a fantasy you know because I know I live in the same world that everybody else lives in and I don't have any time for me to go to when I go to the Met I feel like I'm playing hooky or I'm getting away with murder or something because I've somehow found an afternoon where I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing I'm not supposed to be seeing art basically you know and have trouble getting to do anything that I really care about. So I know, I know that there are genuine difficulties and, I th and, and unfortunately I think that the real changes that are gonna take place will initially be because of disaster. So, because I, I think that the country is, it, se it seems like it's most likely going towards a crash for one thing, I mean an economic crash and an economic crash is gonna transform the, the premises of the art world and of who gets to make art and what art is and in, at the very worst, we would find ourselves back in the 30s, which is actually, it, in that moment of utter poverty and anonymity, is the, the germ of the great moment of expansion of American art. Um, so that would be the realistic view, <laughs> which is a very pessimistic one. So, so I definitely said, this is, a, this is if I could wave a magic wand, I would give myself the treat of being able to sleep and to lay fallow and to produce in a way that was not, you know, functioning by the strictures of the market. Yes, it's better to remember that there once was something or to th look forward towards something that could be good. And in an odd kind of way, I feel like, um, I find myself thinking, you know, the Enlightenment really wasn't that bad. You know, I mean, there's certain things about the Enlightenment that maybe we could actually look back to. I mean, it's, it's a funny thing because one thinks about it from so many different angles. Suzanne. Yeah, Sort of the elimination of six years of art school um, I, the I would, I would like feeds you me. to be a little proactive with this comment and what you would replace it with. It's very oh. easy to be contra, but oh, my, what's my, your my, position? Well, let's put it this way. I, this, is, this is something that's based on all my years of teaching, which is I really think it's important to get a liberal education, a liberal arts education. And I think that there's a tremendous sameness to people who go to college, major in art, and then go to an art school without any kind of break in between. So what do you do? And then on top of that, they get a, it used to be, then they'd get a job a year later teaching and like no, you know, like where's the experience? Where's the life experience that would be enhancing art? That's really my most basic feeling about it. Um, and then there's certain, well, for example, I mean the simplest is the, to really enhance the, the education part of liberal education or of even within art schools. And I think art school, I mean, art schools genuinely try to, uh, to provide as much academic uh, information or material as possible, but I think it's very different than when there's always the sense of identification that you're an artist, you know, and especially in fine arts that still holds some of the ideas that the 80s seemed to interrupt, but now we, you know, the waves of Charybdis have like come back over the pebbles and intellectualism isn't as valued as it was for a brief time. So that idea, you know, I don't know, I just paint, you know, I'm a painter, you know what I mean? You know, and there's like no, there, so, so people can fall back on that kind of lack of intellectualism. And now, instead of it being uh, Pollock's nature, it's also the market, so it's like what it, that that enters into it in a particular way. So that's that's a very that's like my simplest thing, or or a break between. But I've actually really been trying to think from the point of view. Mostly, my teaching is in you know MFA at this point, graduate fine arts studio. What could one do? Because part of the problem is that 
for all of those six years, you'll, you'll talk to students, and as I point out here, it'll turn out that they won't know so much about art. Now where, you know, so where can they get that time? And I think it is utopian. It is utopian to hope that they would have time. I am gratefully and painfully aware that I benefited from growing up at a particular time in history in America where I actually did have time to, I mean, A, I was lucky because I was born into the art world, but also there was just a lot of time in the 60s and 70s to just hang around and you know, not have to make that much money and hang out with your friends and go see art. And that was sort of the way I thought life was supposed to be. It turned out not to be. So I, so I, I, have, I feel like luckily I tanked up on art during the, you know, during the six, 50s, 60s, and 70s. And so like a camel, I can sort of get through. But I feel, I feel sort of sorry in a way for my students because I think their concerns and their problems are much more intense and don't leave them that time, but unfortunately then I have to, I'm not, I'm not criticizing my students, but it's more that when I go into the art world, I'm looking at art that was made, just made by students who are coming off that very, very thin, narrow, anxious surface. So I don't, I don't mean to bite the hand that feeds, but it's a real problem, which I think a lot of us are trying to figure out and while we're in the middle of it. Suzanne? Well, I, I loved your, your talk and the idea, uh, I, I mean, I would like to see what you're, like, I mean, a coming counterculture, you know, uh, criticality in, a, in all senses, but I'm a little baffled by your most recent responses because you're a teacher. I mean, if you, if you find ignorant students, which we all do, assign them to read. I do. You know, I do. I mean, assign them. Assign them. <laughs> they, they can all you know, stand up. Well, I no. Mean, but I mean, fi I mean, I mean, no. I know. I experienced this. I, I, I experienced this. And in my, in my experience as a itinerant adjunct for many years before I, uh, I find that it's not even the students. It's the culture of the institution. If the culture, if the institution yeah. does not value artists being thinker artists as Michelangelo was and, and you know and and many recent art, thinker artists then the culture will uh, will will condone the attitude of uh, oh I don't carry on an intelligent conversation I'm visual mm -hmm. there just aren't hours enough in the day that's that's the basic problem I mean what I what I feel from my students I give a grade, but I own, but I'm paid very little for very few hours. Um, I mean, very, very, very little from my point of view, and very few hours from their point of view. Although they have so many hours of so many different stuff to do that they have no time to think and no time, and everything becomes like something that's, you know, trying to leech them of energy rather than to give it to them. Um, and I can't, I can't, for just very practically, it's hard to conduct a graduate seminar when actually you really should be teaching Art History 101 at the same time. It's, and, and at the same time, I sense a craving for something that I got to do, which was just to hang out with artists. I mean, one of my most vivid memories was working for Red Grooms, and um, at that time he was married to Mimi Gross. And we were working on some project. The house was filled with all kinds of wonderful art and amazing art books. and. Mimi was so busy that she couldn't eat, and there was this uh, sunny side up egg you know, that had been sitting for a couple of hours. She sat down to eat it and said, That is the best egg I ever ate. That, that moment happened. That's one of those moments on which maybe someday a, an essay can, you know, find it'll find its place. But it stayed in my mind for over 35 years because it had to do with this richness of culture and practice and just hanging around in somebody's studio. Who has time to do that now? I don't even have time to have an assistant because I'm so busy that, and there's no room to put one, you know? But I mean, that's the very different than just, how does somebody live? How does somebody live as an artist? You know, those are the most basic things. And, you know, three hours a week, forget it. Sheila. 
as usual, it's an amazing diagnosis of <laughs> where we are. And I just want to follow on this time and follow this comment you made about your experience with the egg. Um, I think one of the biggest problems, and it's related to time, is also developing a culture that embraces anonymity. Totally, yes. Yeah. And I think part of what gets confusing is that this experience totally, I don't know, we use the word authentic, wonderful experience you had with the egg and Red Grooms and Mimi Gross, I think for our students gets wound up um, with this notion of glamour of the artist. And it's, it's very confusing, I think. And I don't know, I don't know, you're, you're probably thinking about how to do this. I'd love to hear your thoughts on how do we tr literally troubleshoot the situation? What kind of stories get told? I'm not sure. How I well, you know, I wrote an essay called "On Failure and Anonymity as the Truest Experiences of, of Being an Artist" and how it would be important to teach people that. And. Um, I can't fathom the kind of obsession that my, I don't really understand the obsession that some of my students have with Warhol or whatever. But one thing is for sure, the, 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 the factory or you know, all various things were actual living entities which were to some extent practiced or enacted in a relatively anonymous culture compared to now. Um, and I think that one of the things that gets lost, because it's, we're, we're not a country that's very interested in process, in, wa in work itself. We're, so what gets lost is that the richest moment is the moment before celebrity. I mean, literally, in terms of the, a lot of the great art and even the people who have glamour and celebrity around them, those moments where they were the most creative and had a circle around them that was the most creative were when they were basically just doing it for themselves and each other. And not, I'm not totally naive. I mean, I, there's always an art world of some kind. There's always somebody you're trying to impress. But the whole thing is, op is often so much small, you know, was smaller, was much more human. It was a real culture. And the idea of Warhol or wanting to be famous, art star, is totally unrelated to anything organic and real and about making. But it is a societal, culture-wide problem. I mean, we're a country that doesn't make anything. So what can you, and, and in fact, we're a world where making something has become a very cheap thing. Hi, um, actually, I have a, a friend who got into the art star thing, and he's a good painter. And yeah. You know, did they actually, he's a good painter. Did they do the Did they do the series, or the series never got picked? I don't up? know. He got followed around for a while they're, with the they're camera. Do it. They're, 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 they just had the opening at Dyche a couple nights ago. Oh, they ago. did. Now mm -hmm. it's going to be played, I guess, this yeah. year. But, but anyway, he's a good painter. So, um, I okay. In critique the other day, um, I'm a painter, and um, we, we go to Cooper, but um, that's okay. I, I found myself. <laughs> So I'm showing these paintings, and I found myself, I'm like, okay, well, these are feminist paintings. So I find myself fighting with the other smartest girl in the class about how, <laughs> if they're feminist or not. Uh -huh. And I was, I was shocked, you know, because I was like, well, fuck, I'm a girl. I'm telling you they're feminist. We don't know what feminism looks like these days. How can you fight me about this? Uh -huh. So I was wondering, <clears throat> what is your particular criterion <laughs> for art, including feminism, in this day and age? Whoa. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> um, first, you have to have a feminist analysis of power and of how you in your life participate in power or have been created by power. You, you have, you know, that's, that's the start, I think. And part of the, you know, the early training of feminism were, were things like consciousness raising, which people make fun of now, but 
it actually was very useful because it meant that women would actually talk about their real lives, about real issues in their lives, and it would break down, it would, it would point to things that you thought of as personal, and we've gotten to think of it as like, you know, Oprah, victim culture, blah, 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 but things that were personal, and then lo and behold, it would end up that some woman who you had nothing in common with from any other point of view, she might be gorgeous, she might be rich, whatever, you actually had certain things in common. It would make you analyze your life from a political point of view. And that analysis was then entered into art in some way. And that analysis also applied to the history of art, to the language with which art is written about, the values of art, the whole idea of the genius. Um, and, um, and then there are many, you know, within that, there are all kinds of art that can be or not feminist or look or not feminist. Not all feminists make art that represents, you know, a political view or is representational. I've just written an essay about um, the role of abstraction in, within feminism and how often women who paint abstract paintings get dropped out of an identification or analysis of as feminist. So it's a complex uh, thing. It's very funny because I, I actually edited out. It's, it, there, it's interesting to see how easy it is to edit feminism out. And, um, and so we, we're, here we are. I mean, I think of this a lot in terms of culture. You know, we're, we're looking or, you know, the news. Terry Schiavo, Schiavo, did any, did any, was there a feminist analysis of that? that appeared on the news? I mean, a, who owned a woman's body? There was no feminist analysis of that. What's happening in Afghanistan? What's happening in Iraq to women? What will happen to them? Who cares? No one cares. I mean, it's all, they're just as much as if you were talking about the code of Hammurabi or, you know, how, you know, whether or not you have the right to sell your wife or not, you know. Um, is still happening in a lot of the world. We happen to be in a world where we think that things are a little bit better, but they're actually not better. And that's the same thing as waiting for the you know, economic crash. Some really, really, really bad things may happen very soon, and young women will have to think differently than they have been the last few years. Um, I'll read to you the passage I cut out. Once my little boat charts its course between Scylla and Charybdis, October and Art Forum, I still navigate in my own private sea with its unexpected monsters, all of whom once were or are still beautiful nymphs. This is a stormy and contested sea. My teachers think I'm a traitor because I have in the most carefully calibrated terms suggested their work wasn't very good or true to their principles and because I grew into theory feminism. But I sailed against the tide and tried to speak for visual pleasure in painting against the critique of visual pleasure in the name of feminist theory and was told that I was wrong, wrong, wrong. And now some younger women exult in the victory of post-feminism just at the point we are all about to be put back into burqas triangulated nonconformism at its most ironic. But on the other hand, feminism is my boat, and it's also the sails, the wind in my sails, to be totally, you know, uh, corny about it, you know, because for me, feminism is, do, are women considered equal inherently? As, as long as laws can give or take away their freedom, they're not. So I look back to the 19th century ideas about feminism, and that's, that's really like how, I, how my little boat goes through. But it is a very contested sea, and it's a difficult identification. Jack. I, I, I've heard a lot. I mean, you've covered a lot of really good points. I've heard a lot in terms of uh, Optimism. I've heard a lot in terms of pessimism. Mm -hmm. it, it tends to go both ways with you. Yeah. <laughs> Which is all good and fine. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of young artists in here tonight. 
We spoke about the marketplace somewhat, at least an allusion to it. What, what's your advice in terms of, for young artists, in terms of survival? Considering all that you've said and all the points that you've covered, I mean, what, what do you offer as advice for the young artists? I think my, my advice in practice is, in terms of what I teach, is on the one hand to be, my time is up. Um, <laughs> Um, there is, there is no solution. No, I, I try. I, I think on the one hand, I really feel that people have to be intellectually awake, and um, so I stress the importance of reading text and having some historic sense of history. And at the same time, and this is where there's a little bit less time, but it is part of what I teach. Who are you? You know, think about. Who you like to try to develop roots that are deep enough so that you can withstand what's going to happen when you leave school, how you're going to continue to be an artist. You have to have some sense of really who you are, who your background, your family life, your, what, what you love, what, what things you can bring into your work. And um, so that, those, are, those are the basic two directions in which you know, my teaching goes. I don't do that much actual studio teaching, but then sometimes I'll have a very surprising encounter. I'm looking at one of my students where she suddenly, she, suddenly I just talked to her about stand oil. And she said, this is a very surprising direction that this conversation has taken. But that was really to talk about the pleasure of studio life and the knowledge base of um, how a painting gets done, you know, so it, it, it's, and that's why so much time is needed because it's so complex to be an artist and so hard to be an artist. And as the daughter of artists, and I certainly, my mother did not want me to become an artist because she knew how hard it was, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a tough, tough field. So anyway, so everything, you need everything, you need to know everything and it, and it takes in reality, many, many years to know even a little. And that's why the speed of our art world and our culture is so dismaying, because I don't think people are evolving at the speed at which the culture has evolved. You know, I don't think the human brain has evolved to that speed. Thank you very much. <laughs> On that.